Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I will preface this by saying I know it's uh, late afternoon. I will try and keep folks awake. Um, I'll keep it at a pretty good pace. I've got a, quite a few slides and don't mind uh, the text heaviness of it. Uh, this presentation was actually requested already by a couple friends in the US uh, that wanted a standalone. So uh, yeah, look at the pretty pictures. Uh, leave it to me to jabber on about uh, what I'm gonna talk about here. So I will start by saying uh, I started doing this type of work in the mid 1990s dealing with uh, reptiles at risk and the impacts of Phragmites. So I'm going on over 25 years of tromping through hundreds of kilometers of this uh, horrible plant. And it was probably about 2000, I started bringing the issue up with uh, um, recovery teams at the time and uh, with government agencies saying, we need to do something, we need to do something. And no one would ever do anything, partly because no one knew what to do at the time, didn't know what legalities were with some of the, the, the sprays and stuff like that. Um, so by the time I was on Kasiwik and then Casero, I was like a broken record. We need to deal with this. It's going to impact these animals. Uh, and now we're at a point where we're seeing some change. We're seeing um, the impacts from the, the threat mitigation. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the impacts to these animals, why it impacts turtles especially, but also some of our rare snakes, and some uh, ideas on what we can do to uh, mitigate some of these threats. So, um, you'll notice that uh, it is a, a little bit more geared toward uh, areas with significant um, amounts of species at risk, though some of the information can be used at a number of smaller sites that maybe stuff uh, snapping turtles or painted turtles. Uh, however, uh, the, the information and the data collected were in some of the most important sites for uh, some of these species at risk in Canada. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully all of this works and we will go from there. So I might lose my camera here. Let's see. Okay, so I've lost my, my camera, so I can't see what's going on or the chat. So I'll go through the presentation. And if anybody needs to get a hold of me, you'll have to uh, come up on the speaker because I won't be able to um, see anything come up. Um, I'll see if there's a way. I don't think I can change that. So anyways, we'll go ahead. So reducing the impact of Phragmites and Phragmites control efforts on reptiles. So uh, Phragmites control, you know, people need to get it done. Uh, get the job done. Time is money. Limited funding. Delays in permits. Poor weather conditions. High water, machinery issues, public perception, frustration with hassles that always come up. I need to deal with as few people as possible and need a result that looks nice for the public and that is effective for wildlife. But then this guy shows up. So unfortunately... Um, Sorry, I don't yeah. mean to interrupt. Um, we are seeing your... Um, yeah, I'm seeing your PowerPoint screen, but not in a full screen mode. Oh, okay. Um, Let me try again here. That's not any better. If you'd like to quickly quickly send me the file through the chat, um, I can open it up for you if you're having trouble and navigate it for you. Yeah, this is very strange and it's unfortunate because I'm gonna be rapid fire through this. So um, this is just gonna cause more delays. So I apologize. I, I, I wonder, control uh, of it. 
Yeah, I wonder, Brittany, I mean, I we can still see the slide, so maybe just let Scott continue because it's more of the information. We can still see a bit of the slide there. I, I would just say just keep going, really. Okay, because my options are, are, I have three options and I shared entire screen and that didn't work, so. Okay. I will try it one more time. You'll just have to navigate in your sort of PowerPoint view, if that makes sense. Yeah. That looks good. Thank you. Oh, now we can see your presentation mode. Did it come up? It, it was there for a second. <laughs> there it is. How's that looking? That looks good. Okay. I will try and blast through this even quicker now. So again, a lot of issues people uh, deal with in order to make uh, their work happen for control of Phragmites. And unfortunately, uh, species at risk can slow down that uh, process, but obviously this work is being done in order to protect species, including species at risk. So we need to uh, care about what's going on within these natural areas that have been impacted. So in Ontario, there are 26 native reptile species, 17 snakes, eight turtles, and one lizard. 18 of these species are designated as at risk, both federally and provincially, seven of eight turtles, 10 of 17 snakes, and our only lizard. Uh, approximately 61% of the world's 356 turtle species are threatened or already extinct. And there's a reason that I'll be highlighting turtles uh, more so than, than snakes even, because they do have an interesting uh, long-lived natural life history. They have a late age of maturity. It can take up to 20 years for some species before they lay their first clutch of eggs. They have a very low juvenile to adult recruitment rate. Uh, adults of some species may need 50 to 80 years to replace themselves in the population, and they can live many decades and in some cases over 100 years. Unfortunately, present day issues cause a lot of problems. There's fewer turtles that reach maturity. Uh, many mature animals have shortened lives because of road mortality, hunting, persecution, various other threats. Uh, fewer nests hatch, fewer young reach maturity due to human subsidized predators and other disturbances. Uh, habitat fragmentation and habitat loss can directly impact populations and can also prevent opportunities for animals to expand their range. And also, uh, climate change is resulting in major problems for turtles, including inappropriate incubation temperatures, flooding, and drought. So turtles are really getting hit hard. So if you think of these uh, uh, in comparison to any other creature, there's not too many animals that compare to definitely not a, a, a eastern cottontail or a white-tailed deer or even a slower reproducing animal like a bear. Uh, they have the really unique um, set of, of, of circumstances when it comes to their ecology and biology, making them highly susceptible to loss. So why does this matter and uh, what do we not know? So loss of even small numbers of adult turtles can result in population declines and eventual collapse. So if you have an animal that's already at risk, and you are um, seeing issues due to Phragmites and, and all these other uh, threats, um, that population is, is very fragile. So any additional mort mortality uh, can lead to population collapse. Uh, we also need to reassess what we think we know about turtles and turtle habitat. There's not enough research that has occurred in most areas and threat mitigation options will constantly evolve with new discoveries. So there's ongoing issues. Uh, Phragmites obviously has a negative impact on reptiles. Uh, Phragmites control is absolutely necessary, but it must be done in a way that does not further threaten these species at risk. Phragma uh, Phragmites control will need to occur on an ongoing basis, though at low lower levels each visit. Once frag is removed, it can take years for the habitat to be appropriate for species that previously used the area. And although not ideal, many species at risk utilize sections of Phragmites dominated wetlands of necessity, putting them at risk during removal activities. So I won't say that they've completely adapted to Phragmites. Phragmites is, is definitely a threat to them, uh, but they are using habitats um, in a way that they can still carry out some life processes. A few of our turtle species in Ontario. Again, I'm just gonna skip through uh, some of these photos a little bit. Uh, some of our snakes. So why are reptiles declining? Obviously there's a slew of, of threats, habitat loss, road mortality, illegal collection, persecution, non-native species, subsidized predators, 
climate change, the list goes on and on. Uh, we are talking about non-native plants today, and they're one of many, but if we took out half those threats, uh, the other half will still cause the decline and potential loss of many of these animals. So habitat loss is a big one, and it's different on how you interpret it. So habitat loss can mean actual loss of habitat, that we have cut down the forest, drained the wetlands. Um, however, it can also mean areas that have been lost due to invasion of a non-native species. But when you look at the landscape in general, especially in southwestern Ontario, you see that there's very few natural areas remaining. And unfortunately, it's those handful of natural areas that retain um, natural habitat and some of these species at risk, but they are some of the most heavily impacted by Phragmites. And obviously, uh, not going to preach to the choir, this is a plant that is massive, dense, and prevents uh, you know, any real biodiversity to, to um, sustain in the long term. So I'll show you a few shots of some of my work over the years and some of my sites. So 2003, this is all the same site, uh, 10 years later in 2013. So it gives you an idea of the habitat that species such as spotted turtle, Blanding's turtle, and fox snake will use on the left. And in 2013, the habitat that they are forced to use because there are a few options for them to go outside of these impacted areas. Uh, 1996 to 2016. So when I took the 1996 photos, there were um, small patches of Phragmites. Uh, 20 years later, these sites are completely dominated by Phragmites. 1997 to 2017, you can see some of the turtles we just captured. Uh, 20 years later, uh, the same pond uh, is, is heavily impacted. 2004 to 2016, same scenario, this low uh, um, wet meadow habitat has turned into a large Phragmite stand. And it also impacts upland terrestrial sites. So our spiny softshell turtle nesting habitats have changed quite a bit. 1996, in the background, you can see that there is uh, a couple, um, you know, Phragmites strands sticking up. By 2007, quite a bit more was coming down the uh, edge of the uh, beach. And by 2017, it had eradicated the uh, usable nesting habitat. So there is still some sand available, but that sand is damp uh, and impacted by storm events. The upland areas where the turtles need is now gone and, and uh, taken over by Phragmites. So it is a plant that obviously uh, overtakes the shallow uh, wetland habitats and will stop at deeper water. And it is these deeper water areas that some turtles, such as snapping turtles, are forced to use, uh, whereas they would prefer to use a mix of some deeper water areas and some shallow water areas. So we are, uh, and have been, looking at for about 27 years now, um, work on, on reptiles and reptiles at risk in Ontario. So we want to uh, investigate population sizes, movement, habitat selection, threats, behavior, and all these things that will ensure uh, sustainability of populations. So we would inject microchips or not shells in order to identify um, various animals. And we would also attach radio telemetry tags in order to follow these animals through their uh, wetland and or river or lake environments. So I, I always want to be clear to people that species risk habitat might not look like you think it will. Um, I've often had people say, well, this is just a grassy field. Um, well, uh, the reality is this is the most important habitat type for one of our most endangered turtles in Canada, the spotted turtle. Uh, sure, there's a lot of grasses and sedges. Uh, there is some shallow water in between. This is not your typical pond habitat, and that's not where you're going to find good densities of spotted turtles or even blanding turtles. So Phragmites will slowly overtake shallow wetland habitats, and it's these wetland, shallow wetland areas that are vital to the survival of a number of, of species at risk reptiles. Uh, Phragmites impacts the most important areas of these habitats, which is the shallow, soft bottom, and often most biodiverse, uh, biodiverse areas of these um, wetland habitats. And Phragmites will surround deeper pools while increasing in density throughout shallow water habitats. And the end result is a thick stand preventing or altering movement it changes the thermal or the heat dynamics within uh, an area, and it also reduces general biodiversity, and that can mean food sources as well as uh, cover and many other uh, opportunities for species at risk. And of course, the, the ultimate finale is this wall of bamboo-like 
uh, read. And it is difficult for us to get through, but also difficult for even small animals to get through. Uh, but I need to make something clear too, that there's a significant difference between areas comprised of mostly dense Phragmites and areas with a large percentage of Phragmites. So a very dense stand of you know, 95 to 100% Phragmites, that's one thing. And we, we generally don't see a heck of a lot of turtle use, so we do get some still. Uh, however, we have a lot of areas with a high percentage of Phragmites within it. And it's these areas that we still find uh, good numbers of some of our species at risk reptiles. So in each of the photos that you can see on the screen, uh, you can see a heck of a lot of Phragmites, uh, but this is where we get the bulk of our turtles when an area has been inundated by Phragmites. Phragmites overtakes those shallow water areas and the turtles need the shallow water still, so they've had to make a choice, either be on dry land and die or move to shallow waters that have been hit by Phragmites but still have sedge, cattail, grasses, and some other wetland plants that are useful to these species. So what is appropriate habitat? When people take a look at some of these sites, they'll immediately say, well, we're going to look at the ponds or these open water areas and, and we'll avoid them with machinery or we'll, we'll, we'll ensure that those are, are safe. Uh, but you also need to ensure that you protect the cattail areas and the wet sedge meadows and the, and the grass tussock meadows. So there's a lot of uh, other habitat types that don't immediately come to mind when people think turtles. Uh, but what we found is that it is the periphery and the buffer around these habitats that also maintain good numbers of uh, reptiles at risk. So if we just focused on those ponds, we would lose the bulk of our um, reptiles at risk during any um, mitigation options. And if we, uh, you know, incorporated the, the sedge and grass meadows and, and the more sparse cattail stands, we're getting better, but a bulk of these animals we find within Phragmite stand edges uh, along the periphery of their more regular habitat. And these Phragmite stands act as a heat sink, a wind block, uh, they provide cover from predators, and again, they retain some of that shallow water habitat that these animals need. So it's not perfect, but they have found a way to use them until something changes, or they die out, or get pushed out. Um, and as mentioned already, it's very difficult for them to get pushed out because there's nowhere left to go in many of these Phragmites dominated areas. So uh, although less common, uh, keep in mind that turtles can be found in some of the densest uh, areas of Phragmites. You won't find too many big turtles, uh, but little turtles that can get through the, the stalks will sometimes show up. And this is a young Blanding's turtle at one of my research sites this past fall. I walked um, through, you know, about a kilometer of Phragmites and on my return trip, I found uh, Blanding's turtle had pulled up and tried basking on some of the fallen uh, Phragmites that I pushed down. So I also need to convey the importance of muskrat lodges along with wet meadows. Uh, they are habitat for many wetland reptiles. They're basking, nesting, thermoregulation, cover, hibernation, foraging habitat. And unfortunately, they remain quite hidden within Phragmites stands, and they often get uh, destroyed during uh, Phragmites control. So whenever possible, try to avoid these uh, muskrat lodges. They're important for so many species. Uh, also, spotted turtles will often nest in grass tussocks, hummocks, built up piles of vegetation, along with the muskrat lodges and young will often overwinter within the nest chamber emerging the following spring. So if your activities to get rid of Phragmites occur in the winter and you take out the grass tussocks uh, and the uh, muskrat lodges, which are some of the last remaining habitats in some of these Phragmites stands, uh, you'll probably be taking out the young turtles that are still within the nest chamber. So Phragmites control options, there are uh, various ones, but I'll kind of chat about the ones that are maybe most relevant to reptiles, and that is um, machines that are going to be cutting, uh, you know, Phragmites, as well as rolling, as well as prescribed burns. So cutting and rolling equipment can pose a risk within uh, sensitive wetland areas. There are a few areas that provide escape habitat. As I mentioned, there's not too many areas for these animals to go once a habitat has been altered. And uh, high water years, uh, they can sometimes provide temporary reprieve for these animals because the animals extend to areas that haven't been impacted by Phragmites but still have grasses and sedges. Um, and why well, say temporary? Because those will soon be invaded by Phragmites as well. Um, so unfortunately, uh, when we see, uh, you know, a lot of the 
uh, recovery actions, which are overall good in the long term, need to be um, done in a way that will cause less problem to many of these animals. So because Phragmites is so extensive in some areas that the control efforts are often equally as is extensive, but we get issues where many of these animals are injured and you can get multiple shell injuries, uh, broken tails, uh, again, more shell injuries, um, spotted turtles with broken shells and uh, the dead blamings turtle in the center that was crushed, uh, broken mandibles, broken legs, broken jaws. So this machinery um, does pose a threat to these animals. And it's not isolated incidences. We're still finding numerous animals that were impacted by um, the, the control methods. And, and again, it's, it's balancing, you know, is there an allowable loss? Is there um, something that we can um, say, well, we're doing the best we can with the, the resources that we have. And I would say to that, that yes, that's important, but we also need to, when we have the information available to us, to find some alternatives to still do the same work uh, and still protect many of these animals. Um, because it's not only the animals themselves that get injured and killed, we've had major losses of critical habitat. Uh, a couple photos here showing the before and after of the loss of some of our most important and the largest known hibernaculum in uh, Canada uh, for some of our species at risk, turtles, and a single winter uh, the entire site was, was rolled cut uh, and that hibernacum was lost and we still don't know the outcome for many of these animals. During surveys in 2019 and 2020, uh, they did not return. There's no native vegetation that was able to replace um, this hibernacula in that area. And this is one of, I think, four that were lost that winter. So this is where it becomes not just one or two animals that are lost. This is where we see we can destroy a population if we're not careful about our methods. And again, this is uh, you know, a major difference uh, between, and even with the high lake levels that, that we've been seeing in recent years, uh, the areas that weren't rolled and cut that have the same depth still provide um, hibernacular habitat uh, for many of these animals. So we know that uh, you know, high lake levels are definitely causing uh, issues, but it is being compounded by the impacts of some of the Phragmites control. And it is difficult to often say to people that there are uh, turtles or, or reptiles using some of these sites. Uh, this is a about 40% Phragmites, maybe 60% sedge, uh, or maybe 50-50. If you look a little closer, you can see that we've got animals that readily use these habitats. Again, this is a a basking habitat for spotted turtle and a, and a garter snake on top of the spotted turtle. So they will actively use sites impacted by Phragmites. And this is a, an example of a, of a sparsely impacted area, but some more heavily impacted areas, densely vegetated areas. Uh, we will still see um, spotted turtles, blaming turtles, fox snakes using them. So this is just a small video. I don't know if it'll play for everyone. Hopefully it is. And uh, just gives you an idea of, of one of the many options that there are for cutting and rolling. And as you can see, it's basically a lawnmower on the back of uh, the Marshmaster. And you can imagine this going through a wetland area with multiple uh, animals or species at risk that are just below the surface and actually use the Phragmites to hide in. Uh, and it's not necessarily something that is going to be compatible uh, with the survival or, or health of many of these animals. And when you are talking hundreds of acres of, of this, uh, especially when you are looking at the most sensitive areas and the hotspots for these animals, you have to be careful. So I also want to mention too, observing wildlife while operating machinery, the likelihood of, of seeing some of these cryptic shy species is very low. Uh, you may luck out and you may find a few, but if you found a few, it's guaranteed you have found one of the bigger hotspots. Uh, many of these species, spotted turtle, blamings turtle, fox snake, they are difficult to find for experienced herpetologists during the right time of year. Uh, so very difficult to impossible to find uh, during um, the active season when the vegetation is up or in the winter when they are obviously underground. So I will say too, any in, in animals found uh, injured must be brought to a wildlife rehabilitation uh, center uh, immediately. As mentioned, every turtle is important to the population, especially adults, so the more we can do to benefit them, the better. 
Uh, snakes and frag species such as fox snake will use frag stands for foraging, uh, basking cover, and uh, they'll use water to swim, fallen stalks to hide beneath, and also climb to forage and bask. So fox snakes will not use frag um, during the winter, which is good. Uh, they are hibernating underground somewhere. Uh, but they can be found during the active season in both sparse and dense stands. They will often retreat into thicker vegetation and may remain in the path of machinery. Uh, turtles and frag, uh, they'll use sparse to medium density frag stands for various activities, including uh, basking. The reeds can act, as I mentioned, a wind block and a heat sink and provide basking opportunities. Cover to retreat from predators and seek shelter, um, brumation, aka uh, hibernation for reptiles. And in many cases, turtles will not readily avoid machinery. Instead, they will often retreat into the water, vegetation, or substrate in the path of machines. They can remain in the same spot for days to weeks. And in the winter, species such as the spotted turtle may be less than 20 centimeters below the water. So think back to the video of the um, mower going through the marsh. It is definitely going to impact anything that's 20 centimeters below water. Our winters do not provide adequate um, ice cover for most of the winter. So bigger machinery, it's inevitable that they will crash through the ice. And unfortunately, compacted ice and plant roots could potentially injure or kill brumating turtles. I know there's no perfect solutions, but I'll we'll talk about some ideas after. Um, newly cut veg uh, and disruption of sediment during the winter could also impact dissolved oxygen within the hibernaculum, um, making it survive the winter. So options for threat mitigation in areas known to have species at risk. So after herbicide application, and all of this is based on after herbicide application, uh, I will say it's probably a given that any work being done will start with herbicide application. But after that, um, it's best to avoid large machine cutting or rolling in the most important areas of habitat if critical needs of the animal will be impacted, such as a hibernaculum, um, or the animals could be killed outright, especially in a densely populated area for the species. Less invasive options will be necessary to control frag in some of those spots. So leave small islands of longer vegetation as temporary habitat for animals that remain in the area. Such habitat will be used for basking, foraging, cover, and potentially egg laying until native vegetation returns. These areas may need partial manual cutting as well, just to keep them a bit lower and to be in line with the overall control of Phragmites. But it will be sprayed, it should be dead. Um, and as mentioned in the previous talk, uh, many of those areas will just slowly fall into the water over time. But what you don't want to see is a big open water area that used to have vegetation. Uh, spotted turtles and Blanding's turtles will not do well. And when hundreds of acres uh, might be controlled and you are left with just large areas of shallow water. There's nowhere for these animals to haul up and bask, or very few. Uh, the opportunities for food is limited. Um, nesting opportunities, they'll have to move much further, and they will end up in areas that probably are not uh, conducive to long-term survival. And so by creating small islands, it at least provides them something to um, have when they um, come out of hibernation in the spring, and they may use throughout the season until native vegetation grows back. So here's a, a, an example of an area that's been impacted by Phragmites. So by putting in um, a few small, after herbicide treatment, um, allowing a few small areas or a few islands to retain some longer vegetation, whatever the vegetation may be, it will still provide cover opportunities for basking as mentioned and, and foraging. Uh, and also you want to keep big machinery out of the sensitive habitat. So the areas that are sedge, grass meadows, where you know these animals are. Um, you know, there's a lot of unknowns, but there is a lot of information, you know, starting to be found where we know some of these animals do carry out their day-to-day -day activities. So we want to keep big machinery out of areas that are already good habitat. But we also, as mentioned before, need to ensure that we protect the periphery of some of these good habitat areas because the turtles will still be found in a buffer along some of these natural sites. And this is just an example of, of what we might see. So if you have an animal uh, that is in good numbers in a certain area and the entire area is covered in Phragmites, obviously it's those circles that you need to provide a different type of um, threat mitigation for. So you need to probably not be driving a large machine with the cutting machinery through the most sensitive area for species possibly in Canada, which was the case that I talked about earlier. 
and instead need to work in the areas around that. Uh, you know, there may be a few random turtles, uh, but no big hibernaculum, so the risk is a little bit less of impacting those animals. But in the areas where the population is large, where the uh, area is very important for that animal, completely wiping out the habitat, um, there are ways around it. There are ways to find uh, alternatives. And whether that is uh, treating the area, again, the entire area with herbicide, but allowing it to slowly die off itself or go in manually to cut it, some of the vegetation a bit lower. Uh, and you may need to retreat some of the areas that were left uh, if uh, some of the vegetation does grow back and it is non-native Phragmites. So, uh, you know, we can't just go and assume that everything is um, okay to um, completely overtake. So when you are addressing and, and creating these projects, if you have the information where these animals are, um, it's good to uh, use that to the best of your ability. And some of that may require studies prior to and after Phragmites control, um, where species risk are known, but exact location is unknown. You may have to raise the cutting blade to limit potential for injury or mortality. Um, no machinery in areas that are not dense stands of Phragmites. And ensure buffers, again, where species at risk are. And also on a note of prescribed burns, I could talk an hour about that alone, but I will just say that be aware that burning in the spring, summer, and early fall can result in high mortality of reptiles if they have come out of hibernation. A lot of times we have permit delays, weather delays, and people push the limits on when they can do these burns. And I've often seen burns in through May, um, and unfortunately the animals you're trying to protect will pay the price. So options for threat mitigation, uh, speak with experts on threat mitigation options that align with the biology and ecology of the animal. What I would suggest for um, northern map turtles, as you see pictured here, would be very different from what I would suggest for spotted turtles. And again, very different from what I would suggest for softshell turtles. So there's a number of uh, you know, things you need to take into account when designing some of these, uh, these uh, frag control protocols. Use the latest machinery available whenever possible. Obviously, if you have hard substrate, you wanna have the least amount of weight on any animal that does have the unfortunate situation of getting caught under. Uh, do not cut important vegetation areas with heavy machinery and large cutters. Great care is needed to ensure the grass, sedge, cattail, and rush dominated habitats remain at least partially intact. And this includes areas that are mixed with Phragmites. As I mentioned before, it's not as cut and dry. It would be nice if it was black and white that we have Phragmites on one side and we have sedge on the other, but there's that area of overlap that sometimes the bulk of our turtles can be found in and uh, impacting those areas in a negative way could impact that population. So we will have to look at other vegetation removal options in those peripheries or in those buffers. Um, follow timing windows that are appropriate for the species. As mentioned, we all have seen delays and we've all suffered the consequences of them and we've all tried to push the boundaries, but those are there for a reason, uh, especially when it comes to very sensitive species. And also know that paths cut by machinery will often be used by species at risk. So I've seen in many cases that machinery will go through the same path to avoid um, causing disturbance in other areas. And I can appreciate that, but once that path is created, it often results in shallow water and it attracts a number of species because in a Phragmites dominated area, um, they are looking for opportunities to bask, to have easy access from one spot to another. So the next time your machine goes through, uh, there's a chance that it may be filled with a number of uh, you know, frogs and turtles and snakes and birds and a number of other animals uh, because some of those habitats don't really exist in that way anymore. So they will use them when they become available. So habitat and timing. So in deeper water areas, the risk of compaction uh, injuries is reduced, though cutting injuries could still occur. In shallow water areas with a firm bottom or dense root systems of Phragmites, if you've ever felt the root system of Phragmites, you know if a small four inch spotted turtle was pinned between a tread and those uh, very bumpy hard root masses, there's a good chance that the shell could crack. And also during the winter, turtles have limited ability to seek out appropriate habitat after disturbances. So just know that even though these animals are hibernating, uh, if machine goes through the ice, goes through the um, wetland areas uh, without any protection from above, that can cause a number of problems that will impact these animals. So a very brief summary. Again, this is something, this is 25 years of studying Phragmites and reptiles. Um, thrown into a 20 or whatever minute talk. This is something that is days worth of, of conversations, but 
Uh, in summary, in the very bare bones, FRAG needs to be controlled. This is something we all know. A single approach, as we all know, is not effective uh, for all cases, all habitats, and all species. And you need to speak to species experts and work with partners, based mitigation efforts on biology and ecology of the animal, including greater effort for the most susceptible species. Um, birds fly away, fish can sometimes swim away, uh, but species such as turtles, they're stuck there, uh, and their life history does not make them easily uh, replaceable or, or able to replace themselves in the population in the short term. And you need to adjust efforts as new information is found. Uh, what we know now, we didn't know five years ago, and so on and so forth. And long-term monitoring is always necessary. So um, I tried to race through that because I know we are at the end of a long day and I know we have um, five o'clock looming Janice. <laughs> Oh, I have to shut something down. I've got no audio. Give me a second. Ah, me too. Thank ah. you. Thank you there so we much, go. Scott. You're right. There's just so much packed into the your presentation. There's a lot of information there. A lot of questions for me. Uh, the mitigation piece. Lots to think about. I really appreciate that. Um, so thank you very, very much.